I to myself tell people we've seen two false religions in our life one a total corruption of the Old Testament and the other a total corruption of the New in any event open with me please to what we call in Hebrew Maase HaShlechim the Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 the Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 And so when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men of every nation under heaven, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were bewildered because they were each one of them hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and marveled, saying, Why are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Serene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, They are filled with sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel, Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men dream dreams. Even upon my bond slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant you wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Yeshua the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed to him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I was always beholding the Lord in my presence, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will abide in hope, because thou wilt not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou wilt make me filled with gladness, with thy presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants upon his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Yeshua God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Yeshua whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what must we do to be saved? 
And Peter said to them, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread into prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Heavenly Father, we just ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit to open our eyes, our minds, and above all our hearts to the glory, meaning, truth, and majesty of your word. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, Amen. Pentecost Sunday was just two weeks ago. Some people call it the birthday of the church. West Indians like to sing in London. You have a lot of West Indians in London. From the day of Pentecost, the fire fall on me. Fire, 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 the fire fall on me. Wonderful music, West Indians. And uh, on the day of Pentecost, as we'll see this afternoon, it's the book of Ruth that's read in the synagogues, the story of a Jewish man taking a Gentile bride. It's the Jewish feast of weeks, Hag Shavuot, from Leviticus 23. The second of the pilgrim feasts, when Jews would come from all over the world to celebrate this feast, when the book of Ruth is read in the synagogues. This particular day of Pentecost, however, was one like no other. There was the church, a very small church, a very minuscule percentage of the population of the Jews who lived in the land of Israel at that time. Possibly no more than 500 committed followers of Jesus existed possibly no more than 500, and only 120 of those, we can be sure, were really solid in their commitment. And then the lines get smaller and smaller, and the circles concentrically begin shrinking. You've got the apostles, the 70, the 120, and then 500 or so. A very small church. But the church on the day of Pentecost was a church that was waiting for something to happen. It was waiting for an anointing. The Hebrew word, mashach, the Greek word, krio, they were waiting for this to happen. It was a church that was not anointed. More than that, this church was a church that had been betrayed. It had been betrayed not simply by enemies who pretended to be friends, it was betrayed by men among their own number. Describing Judas, in the Old Testament, Jesus, speaking to the Old Testament prophet, says, My friend lifts his heel against me. Judas was called the friend of the Lord. There are two kinds of people who are going to be very close to Jesus. People who really love him and people who are backslidden. That's what was happening at the Last Supper. The apostle who Jesus loved was reclining on his chest on one side, but on the other side was Judas. Jesus will always leave the 99 to go after the one. Backsliders and very holy Christians both have something in common. Backsliders are under continuous conviction of the Holy Spirit to repent, to return to him. Jesus doesn't abandon backsliders, they abandon him. He gives Judas a place of honor, and by giving him the stop at the Last Supper, he gives him a sign of acceptance beseeching him to repent. Backsliders 
or under continuous conviction of the Spirit. But very holy Christians have the same kind of problem. They're also very close to Jesus, but the closer you get to the light, the more you see the dirt and the little specks that other people don't see. Very holy Christians usually don't have a very high opinion of themselves because they're too close to Jesus to be that deceived. The early church was betrayed by one of its own. By one of its own who was one of its leaders, hand chosen by the Lord himself. The second thing that's characteristic of this church is that it's such a small percentage of the Jewish society and it's quivering and it's terrified and its leaders are afraid. Jesus died for them. He gave them a promise but its leaders were afraid. The church was afraid. It was very small. Other people were caught up in their religion. But the church was not only unanointed, it was betrayed. It was very small, and it was afraid. And its leaders were afraid. There was no question that this church was a church that had no power, that had no anointing, and that was sold down the river. But all of a sudden, something dramatic happens. Now you have to understand the Jewish background of Hag Shavuot to understand this. He begins talking about, I will pour out, pour out. If you don't know from my other seminars, different liquids represent the Holy Spirit from different aspects. The new wine is the joy of the Spirit in worship. Oil, shemen in Hebrew, is the anointing of the Spirit. But the idea of rainwater, fresh, clean rainwater being poured out, is Maim Hayim, living water. John 4, Jesus says, I'll give you the living water. But in John chapter 7, verse 39, he says what the living water is. This he spoke of the Holy Spirit. Different liquids teach about the Holy Spirit from different aspects. So this outpouring draws on the language of rain to teach about an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The whole idea comes from a lot of places in the Old Testament, one of which is Isaiah 44, Israel Hanavi, Isaiah chapter 44. Verse 3, I will pour out water on thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. The outpourings of water have to do with outpourings of the Holy Spirit. In Israel, we have the early and latter rains. These correspond to the outpourings of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of the church and at the end. Some of you already know this. But when this happens, you see a result. The spring rains prepare the spring harvest, and the autumn rains prepare the autumn harvest. That has a spiritual equivalent. The rabbis tell us that the Torah, the law, was given to Moses on the same feast, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Pentecost. Only when the Holy Spirit was given, something happened. When the law was given on Mount Sinai, 3,000 fell. But when the Holy Spirit was given, 3,000 were saved. Grace is greater than the curse of the law. One undoes the other. The society was under a curse. But this outpouring of the Holy Spirit had the power to break that curse and to give a harvest. But look who gets anointed. Is it the church that gets anointed? No, it's not. It's not the church who gets anointed. Look at Acts chapter 2, who gets anointed. This Jesus, God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having, He having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured forth this which you see and hear. For it wasn't David who ascended into heaven, but He Himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made Him both Lord and Messiah, 
this Jesus whom you crucified. Jesus was anointed, not the church. What Peter was drawing on here was Psalm 133. Psalm 133. To understand Pentecost, you have to read Psalm 133. In Hebrew, we sing this. He named Atovu Manayim Shevet Achim Gam Yachad. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Now notice this. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon his robes. Aaron is the high priest. Hebrews tells us that Aaron, the high priest, is a symbol of Jesus, doesn't it? In the epistle to the Hebrews. He is our high priest. The oil is poured on Aaron's head by Moses and it goes off of his head over his body down his shoulders, down his arms, all over his torso, and down to his feet. To get the oil on the hands, on the feet, on the shoulders, on the torso, you have to be under the head. One reason the body of Christ is not anointed today is because it is not under the headship of Christ, it is under the headship of man. You can have a very able hand, a very good foot, but it's useless unless it's attached to the body. And the body is useless unless it's under the head. The anointing is poured on the Lord Jesus. If the body of Christ is not under his headship, it is not going to be anointed. But then there's something else. Look at Acts 2 after it's anointed. What happens? They were all together of one mind, of one accord. What does Psalm 133 say? How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It's talking about the unity of the Spirit. If there is not a unity of the Spirit, there is no anointing. Another reason there is no anointing in the body of Christ today is because there is not a unity of the Spirit. There is a unity of man. The Holy Spirit in Hebrew is Haruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of Holiness. There can be no unity of the Spirit where there's an absence of holiness. I firmly believe in the gifts of the Spirit, always have and practice them myself. But if you've ever listened to me before, it is one of my most frequent complaints, because I believe it is the complaint of God Himself, that the level of carnality and worldliness among Pentecostals and Charismatics is much higher than it is among Baptists or Plymouth Brethren or Fundamentalists. Of all the churches in the Bible, it was not the legalistic or nomianistic Galatians or the confused Thessalonians that had to be reminded of the Holy Spirit. It was the charismatic Corinthians. That is equally true for today. There is no unity of the Spirit if there is an absence of holiness. Now the first commandment is, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not make other gods or have strange gods before me. And the second commandment in the original Hebrew is this. You shall not make a graven image of anything in heaven above on earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. In the north of England, there are many people who are born again Christians that were saved out of Roman Catholic backgrounds. Even in this church, I guarantee you there are quite a number of former Roman Catholics who have gotten saved. You come out of that church seeing the truth of the gospel. Seeing that what you were taught and brought up to believe is not what Jesus taught. When someone bows down before a statue and lights candles and prays to the dead, the Hebrew term is avot, familiar spirits. It's an act of idolatry and superstition. It's an utterly abhorrent sin. To tell someone in the name of Christian unity that they can continue to practice this sin is no different than telling a homosexual who gets saved that he can stay a homosexual or an alcoholic who gets saved to keep drinking. But that's exactly what's happening. There's no anointing. Because to be anointing, it must be under the headship of Christ, not the headship of man who are teaching things contrary to Christ. Secondly, the body must be unified. 
But the Holy Spirit, the unity of the Spirit, is the Spirit of holiness. When you have open immorality, open idolatry being practiced in the name of Christian unity, you have a problem. I read the book by the Right Honorable George Terry. What's right and what's honorable are issues I won't go into. It's not my place. Nonetheless, the book is called The Meeting of Waters, called by this person who claims to be a born-again Christian to reunite with the Church of Rome. Now, if you're a saved Roman Catholic, you know very well that they say you've left the one true church unless you go to confession and return to Mother Rome, you're going to hell. We can accept the other quote-unquote Protestants because they don't know any better. So on one hand, this church is telling you you're going to hell because you left it. But leaders of your churches and your denominations are uniting with these people. Going into idolatry. Why is there no anointing? For he's not only the spirit of holiness, he's the spirit of truth. There are two kinds of division. One kind of division is not of God. The other kind of division is very much of God. The kind of division that is not of God is that division which divides Bible-believing Christians from each other. The kind of division that is of God is the kind that separates Bible-believing Christians from ones who don't believe it. Or worse still, who say they believe it, but their lives show differently. He is the spirit of truth. He is not the spirit of error. You cannot build the unity of the spirit based on error. When you see people saying we're saved by the sacraments, we should pray to the dead, we're going to atone for our own sins in purgatory, when that's being taught and you see born-again Christian leaders saying that it's okay to believe that and we should be one with these people, that's the spirit of error. It's not the spirit of truth. Paul says there will be factions among you to prove which is true. There are factions that are of God. Jesus said, don't think I came to bring unity. I came to bring the sword, to bring division. I just came from Northern Ireland. I see the same thing in Ireland that I see in Israel. When a Jew gets saved, you betrayed your people. Because Christianity is so associated in the Jewish mind with anti-Semitism and the pogroms and the inquisitions and the Holocaust, you betrayed your people. You've become one of those people who murdered your ancestors. In Ireland it's the same. When a Roman Catholic gets saved, it's seen that way. You become a Protestant. You become part of the people who perpetrated the potato famine and the war crimes of Cromwell and, his, and the genocidal war crimes of the Puritans. The people who divided our land are seen as a traitor to your people. Now, it's very difficult for a Jewish person who gets saved to explain to his family the difference between a Bible-believing Christian and what his family thinks Christians are. And it's very difficult for a Roman Catholic, in Ireland particularly, to explain the difference to his family between a Bible-believing Christian and what they think a Bible-believing Christian is, which then is a Protestant. I know a case recently in Belfast where a Roman Catholic girl got saved. She came to an Assemblies of God church, a Pentecostal church, and the priest told her, if you do not return to quote-unquote the Holy Mother of the Church, I'm going to have the IRA deal with you. That's what he told her. That's exactly what he told her. He is the spirit of truth. He's not the spirit of error. You cannot base a unity of the spirit on error. Now, I'm not talking about secondary doctrinal issues that exist among all of us. I'm talking about the essential issues. How are we saved? The authority of God's Word. What is sin? If it's not under the head, there's no anointing going on the body. And if the body is not united in the spirit, it's not going to be anointed. Look at the church today. What do you have? The same thing you have on the day of Pentecost. In this country, on the average Sunday, in England, 1.2% of the people go to church. 
1.2%. Most of those are Roman Catholics who believe it's a mortal sin to miss Mass. Things like Mothering Sunday and Memorial Sunday and Christmas and Easter drag the overall statistics up to about 8% a month in England. But it's only 1.2% of the people who go to church on a Sunday and most of them aren't saved. We are a very, very small minority, the same as the first Christians. Secondly, we have very, very little power. Very little real power. Thirdly, we too have been betrayed. And we've been betrayed by those who we count among our leaders. I used to be a Baptist. A Baptist who believed in the gifts of the Spirit, but I was a Baptist. I had to leave the Baptist church, even though my own church stood with me, because of the leadership of the Baptist Union, who went into the ecumenical movement to be united with the Roman Catholic Church and with liberal Protestant churches. I oppose this. I know many, many people in the Baptist Church who knew it was wrong, but they were afraid to lock the boat. They were afraid to say anything about it. There's an organization called the Church's Ministry to the Jews. It's Anglican, Evangelical Anglican. When they learned there was going to be an Evangelical Archbishop of Canterbury, they were elated. They thought, that's it, we've won. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for such a faithful, faithful leader. He became the Archbishop of Canterbury. He went on the radio with the chief rabbi, denounced giving the gospel to the Jews, withdrew his patronage from the church's ministry to the Jews and totally, totally went against the cause of giving the gospel to the people of Jesus, to the Jews at the flesh. Paul said, the gospel's for the Jew first and they'll be judged first if they don't accept it. No, says the archbishop. Even a liberal wouldn't have gone that far. The same one who wrote this book telling us we should go back under Rome uh, about 2,000 evangelical Anglican clergymen signed a petition asking him to stop the worship of foreign gods in Anglican churches like Canterbury Cathedral. Where you have these Tibetan monks, Lamaist monks, believe the Dalai Lama is an incarnation of God, African witch doctors, Brahmin priests from Hinduism, Muslim imams, Orthodox rabbis, and the rest of it all getting together with the Anglican and Roman Catholic clergy in Canterbury Cathedral. No, says this born-again Christian leader, I respect all religions. 1 Corinthians 10, Deuteronomy, other gods are demons. Greek, Demonoi, Hebrew, Shadim. No, say our leaders, we respect all religions. Why is there no revival? Why is there no anointing? That's some idea of unity. Think about what's happening. In this country, one out of every three males will have a police record, a criminal conviction, before the age of 30. One out of three. In the inner cities, it's one out of two, and in certain council estates, it's more than three out of four. In this country, one-third of all children are born out of wedlock. In certain places, like Speak in Liverpool, it's two out of three, and it's socially accepted. My grandmother was from Wigan. She emigrated to the United States via the port of Liverpool. If you told my grandmother a time would come when two little children, children, ten-year-old kids, would abduct, kidnap a baby, take him out and murder him. That wasn't the north of England that she knew. The, 
crime rate is going through the roof. Over two million auto break-ins every year in England. Over two million. But it's grown, it's growing at the rate of 32% a year. 32%! Unbelievable! That's what's happening out there. This society is going to the wall. But the reason this society is going to the wall is because the people who God has called to prevent it from going to the wall are unanointed. Why are they unanointed? Because they've been betrayed. Because they're afraid. Because they're not united. At least not united in Jesus. Many people have concocted all kinds of ways to deal with this problem. Nobody in their right mind will look out that window and think everything is all right. Wigan has the best rugby team in the world. I watched them defeat the Maoris. The English team, most of the players, a high percentage of the players, come from right across the street. Nothing wrong with rugby, it's a good game. Every Sunday, that stadium, there's a game, will be filled up with people. Anytime. Nothing wrong with rugby, it's a game. It's a good game. But it's only a game. It's not going to matter a million years from now. Those children in that council estate, one of whom out of three, are going to wind up in jail, they're going to matter a million years from now. If you were to have a heavy metal concert with a rock band that openly admits to Satan worship, they would sell out. If you were to have a strip club, the place would be filled. But you know what? When you have a church that isn't preaching the truth, yet claims to be the church, it's no worse and no better than a strip club or a heavy metal concert or whatever. There's different ways people have tried to get this anointing they say we all need. The charismatic movement is 25 years old in England. 25 years old old. Look out there. Is there any anointing? Where's the revival? I got saved in a revival. I saw what a revival is. I saw tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of hippies. We're out there getting stoned out of our minds, getting venereal disease, everything. One day, and radically changed by the power of Jesus overnight. I saw revival. I saw what it's like when there is a revival. When Wesley had a revival in the north of England, the society was radically changed. The crime rate nosedived. Immorality plummeted. Social injustice plummeted. All of these things, building societies, to get housing for the working classes, the school system, literacy for the working classes, things like the Guardian newspaper and the trade unions to defend the rights of the disenfranchised, prison reform, hospital reform, slavery abolished in the British Empire, child labor abolished in the British Empire, children four years old were digging in coal mines in Wales and in Newcastle. Four years old, some of them. And those things were changed directly because lives were changed by the power of Jesus. That's a revival. If you want to see a revival today, go to Korea. If you want to see a revival today, go to Kenya. If you want to see a revival today, go to Brazil. If you want to see a revival today, go to Indonesia. If you want to see a corpse, come to the Western world. Look at the characteristics. Peter here delivers something known as a kerygma. You have three kinds of teaching in the Bible, in the original Greek. The daskin, which is like a Bible study. Something called hamelia, which is like a sermon. And something called the 
something called kerygma, which is preaching of the gospel mainly to the unsaved. This is Peter's kerygma. And he begins talking about Jesus from two aspects. The suffering Jesus who was crucified and the conquering Jesus who would have dominion. Now most of you know this comes directly from Judaism. Hamashiach ben Yosef and Hamashiach ben David, the Messiah who is the son of Joseph and the Messiah who is the son of David. First Jesus comes as a suffering servant like Joseph, but then he comes as a conquering king in his return like David. Separate subject, we have tapes on it if you don't know this background. In his first coming, he comes as a suffering servant. When he comes back to set up the millennia, he's the conquering king like David. The point is this. Before Jesus was anointed for dominion, Jesus was anointed for burial. Before Jesus was anointed for dominion, for conquest, for victory, he was anointed for burial. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. For it was fitting for him, in verse 10, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Jesus didn't need to suffer. He didn't have a fallen nature for God to deal with. But he underwent a process theologians called kenosis, and he identified with us even though we had no sin. And for our sakes, he put himself into a position where God had to perfect him by suffering as an example to us and to win the victory for us on the cross. Before the Lord Jesus was anointed for dominion, he was anointed for burial. Before the church can be anointed for dominion, it has to be anointed for burial. It's very easy to see why all of these well intended, but I must say unscriptural, formulas for anointing haven't worked. The charismatic movement is 25 years old in England. Look out there. Are the schools any better? Are there any less crime? Is there any less homosexuality? Any less divorce? Any less racism or hatred or social injustice? Or more people coming to church? Or more lives being changed? Is there any less sexual abuse of little children? No. There's more. After 25 years, what do we have to show for it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I remember people saying with well intention that this charismatic renewal was the key. This charismatic renewal had a unity, but it was not the unity of the Spirit. It's okay, whatever your church is, whatever your church believes, you want to be a Roman Catholic, you want to pray to the dead, you go ahead. No anointing. Then there's the name it and claim it people. Faith, prosperity. That's the key. Go to America. The only key they have now is the key that locks them up in jail. The ones who haven't been, <laughs> have been caught already. The others are still wanted men. These people have made born again a household joke, coast to coast, and these same people and same kinds of people are coming into your country even at this minute, even at this very hour. Faith, prosperity. They say, that's the key to getting the anointing. Just believe it, brother. Reach out and claim it by faith. Well, if you want to know about faith, the best way to begin is by reading the faith chapter, Hebrews 11. Let's read about that kind of faith. Look at the end of it. Others experience mockings and scourgings, also chains and imprisonment. Believe God for that Cadillac, brother. Just believe God you're going to prosper. Your business will prosper. Believe God you're going to grow. Your church will grow. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Why? Because of their faith. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. Why? Because of their faith. They went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute. Destitute. Impoverished. Their faith didn't make them rich. Their faith made them poor. 
They were not hoping in this world. They were hoping in what's going to come. I'm not saying we should trust God for poverty, but we should trust God whether we have riches or poverty. Let's look. Afflicted, ill-treated. They were sick. Men of whom the world was not worthy. Living in mansions in Beverly Hills? No. Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. All of these having gained approval. How? Through their faith. These so-called people who are saying their so-called faith prosperity movement is the key to the anointing. They are not teaching faith in Jesus. They are teaching faith in faith. This is faith. Anointed for dominion? Yes. But anointed for burial first. I've seen so many failed businesses up and down this country and all over America, coast to coast, Christian businessmen who wanting to, to, to pull through, understandably, were seduced by these people telling them this stuff. Just write a check for 500 and God will bless it and multiply it back, and they did it. Now, if God tells you write a check for 500 or 5,000, you do it. You let God tell you, not some conniver from America. I ought to know. I was born in that country. The charismatic movement promised something, but it couldn't deliver. Why? Not scriptural. Couldn't produce an anointing. The faith prosperity movement promises something it can't deliver. You don't believe me? Talk to one of the thousands of Christians who've lost their businesses, or their homes, or their jobs. Why? Because it's not scriptural. No anointing. The ecumenical movement. One of the greatest men of God I ever read about was someone called Bishop J.C. Ryle, the first bishop of Liverpool. They won't even sell his books in the Liverpool Anglican Cathedral. They sell rosaries instead. You've got the two bishops, the Anglican one, David Shepherd, and the Roman Catholic one, Bishop Warlock, good name. That are together. They say that's the key to, to revival in England. About the most ridiculous and pathetic of all these man-made ideas for anointing, well, actually there's two. The first is the restoration movement. To restore something, it has to be something that existed to begin with. The restoration movement are trying to restore two things which never existed. This movement has been around in this country. It began with Arthur Wallace in the late 60s. Now, he wrote and said a lot of good things, all of a lot of very wrong and unscriptural things. But it began in the 60s. But the movement has been blossoming for about 16 years. Look out there. Where's the revival? They can't deliver any revival. They're trying to restore things that never existed. The first is not apostolic authority, but their version of apostolic authority. Their version of apostolic authority is not the apostolic authority of the New Testament. What they call apostolic authority is something known as heavy shepherding. Never existed in the New Testament. So they're trying to restore something that never existed. The second thing you're trying to restore is this, Kingdom Now Theology. The idea that we're going to conquer the whole world for Jesus, set up His Kingdom, then He's going to come back. It depends on us. It doesn't depend on the return of Christ as such. It doesn't depend on God's prophetic plan, of which Israel and the Jews play a pivotal role. It doesn't depend on that. It depends on us and our movement. Many people propagate this. Roger Forster, Terry Virgo, Gerald Coates, in America, uh, Kevin Connor, Rick Godwin, these people trying to come to, to England with this stuff now from the States. This is what they're teaching. That movement has been around 16 years. Where's the revival? I firmly believe in Bible believing Christians standing together and proclaiming Jesus. The March for Jesus 
seems to be a good idea to me of itself. But what do you do when the people who organized the March for Jesus say, Jesus didn't die to save people from going to hell. There's no such place. You can march all you want. If you don't think that the lost are going to perish, don't expect God to bring a revival through your marching. That's what Graham Kendrick believes. The man is an excellent hymn writer, but that's what he believes. There's no such place as hell. That's what Roger Foster believes. And they're leading all people into these marches with this philosophy, thinking they're going to bring revival. The apostles said, save yourself from this wretched generation. They knew about the lake that burns with fire forever and ever, as it were. The preaching of Wesley, the preaching of Spurgeon, of anybody, whoever God ever anointed, the preaching of anybody who God ever anointed to bring revival, talked about the holiness of God and the judgment of those who reject the gospel. Today, what do you have? The leaders are saying there's no such place. I had a tremendous respect at one time for John Stott. I'd never thought much of him theologically. He was an Anglican in the 60s. When liberalism was at its real apex, theologically, he stood up for the gospel and the authority of Scripture. I respected him personally. Not doctrinally. I never thought much of his sermons or his books, but I respected him. And he's telling his people there's no such place as hell. These are the leaders. How is there going to be a revival? Do these people really think, really think, that they're ever going to stop what's happening to this society? Do they really think with leaders like this that we're going to stop this society from going to the wall and see a revival with man-made ideas of false unity, of charismania, of kingdom now theology and restorationism, of ecumenism? Sometimes going into open idolatry. They think they're going to bring a revival? The Kingdom Now movement has been here 16 years. I just watched the video recently of what happened in the Docklands Arena. I watched it again. We all know what happened with Mr. Wimber and his Kansas City prophets. They came and they said, Revival is coming in October of 1990. That's what he said. He said, we're the Joel's army, John Wimber did. And then the other Kansas City prophet came out and he said, we're going for 100% accuracy. None of God's words will fall. So he's saying what he's saying is God's words. And it's going to be 100% accurate. I don't care what anybody says. You're going to go out of here seeing a visitation and a revival. That was two and a half years ago. In the last two and a half years, since the visitation and the revival, which was predicted by them to commence in October of 1990, more mosques have been built in England than churches. That's the truth. That's the truth. Now, I'm not knocking or throwing rocks at anybody or anybody's intentions or motives. I believe the people who get caught up in this nonsense are sincere people. I believe they're people who really are concerned with what's happening to this country and who really want to see Jesus lifted up and see souls saved. I believe the people who are getting caught up in all these movements really have good intentions. But the devil knows they have good intentions. Therefore, he puts them on a road. A road to nowhere. Once again, the charismatic movement has been here over 25 years. It made a promise it can't deliver. Why? Because it's not scriptural. The name it and claim it, faith prosperity people, if you really look at what they believe, if you look at the doctrines of Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin, it's their own doctrines, their own books. They quote E.W. Kenyon. Jesus didn't win the victory for us on the cross. He did it when he descended into hell. That's what they believe. The cross is not central to their theology. But look how popular it is. People want to have their ears tickled. But what happens? It can't deliver. Their businesses go bankrupt anyway. They made a promise they can't deliver. Why? It's not scriptural. 
The restoration movement, the Kingdom Now movement, they make a promise they can't deliver. It should have happened in October of 1990, but it didn't happen. They go around marching, making these proclamations. Now is the time for us to march upon the land, they sing. We're building a kingdom of power, not of words. Well, I've heard their words. Where's the power? They haven't got any. Just look. We have these people coming, these chaps from America, and an Englishman with them. Now this is, again, I'm not swinging mud, I'm just stating facts. Rick Godwin, David Shearman, they come, and they're giving these seminars, training for reigning. And you hear what they're saying. Thank you, Lord God, that your kingdom is advancing forcefully. That your kingdom is advancing mightily. Whose kingdom? Satan's? One third of the kids in this country are going to wind up in jail. 1.2% of the population goes to church on Sunday. Most of them aren't even Christians. More mosques being built all over. Teaching Hinduism, Islam, Sikhism. New Age are being taught in schools, even in Church of England schools. They're teaching children to use condoms in sex education in schools. Whose kingdom is advancing forcefully? These people may be perfectly honorable in their motives and in their intentions. I am not attacking them. What I am attacking is their doctrines. I don't question these people's sincerity or their integrity. It's not for me to judge. But what is for me to do is say, is what they are teaching scriptural or isn't it? A, I look in the Bible and I see it's not scriptural. And B, I look out there and I see one thing. They all promise something they can't deliver. What's the answer? Peter says what happens on Pentecost is a shadow of what will happen at the end of the world. He didn't say, this is that. In Greek it says, this is like that. There were no signs in blood and fire and vapor. As it's stated in the text of Joel 2, those things didn't happen on Pentecost. It says, this is like that. Somehow what happened then is a shadow of what happens at the end. What happened then teaches us what happens at the end. At the end, once again... We have a body that's been betrayed. We have a body that's afraid, that's minuscule, whose leaders are terrified, and that's not anointed. Now, the central theology of the Kingdom Now people is the violent men, or the manifest sons of God, or the Joel's army teaching. It's all the same. What these people do is they engage in something called Gnosticism. Instead of dealing what the text says exegetically, they read things into it, it doesn't say, claiming some kind of revelation. We have a tape on the subject, what the Gnostics are. But they say they're Joel's army. And this is what it says in Joel. Now Joel is someone who prophesied very little for his own day, almost not at all. He prophesied almost exclusively for the end of the world. But we know he prophesied either right at the beginning of the Babylonian captivity or right before it. And he's talking about the armies of Babylon. That's what he's talking about. And look what it says. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain, let the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, surely it is near. Now that's an eschatological statement. It's about the end of the world. A day of darkness and gloom a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the dawn is spread over the mountain, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be anything like it again. Now, he's talking in his own time about Nebuchadnezzar's army of Babylon. That's what he's talking about for his own time. But he's saying this teaches about the end of the world. A fire consumes before them and after them, a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but a desolate wilderness after them, and nothing escapes them. Now, the Kingdom Now people, they say, that's us. They say, well, that's them, their movement. Okay? And it describes this army. But look what happens with this army. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your garments... 
and return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger, relenting in evil. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent? In other words, Joel says, if the people repent, God will call this terrible army back. And what happens to this army? Look at verse 20 and 25. I will remove the northern army far from you and will drive it into a parched and desolate land and its vanguard into the eastern sea and its back guard into the western sea and its stench will arise and its foul smell will come up for it has done great things. God is going to judge and destroy Joel's army but that's who John Wimber says he is. Look at verse 25. Then I will, and he actually says this, that we're the locusts. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, the gnawing locust, my army which I sent among you. He calls it his army, but it's his army in the sense of Nebuchadnezzar, the army of Babylon. It's an evil army. The way God judges his people is he brings other evil people against them to make them repent. He's always dealt with Israel that way. That's the context. It's an evil army that God's going to destroy. But the entire kingdom now philosophy is based on the fact that we're this army. Or at least they are, those in their movement. But what happens in the midst of all this prediction of doom and gloom? We read a quotation. In verse 28, what happens? And after this will come about that I will pour out my spirit on mankind. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And even on my male and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, etc. If there's a repentance, God pours out his spirit and calls this judgment back. That's the key to the anointing. That's the key to get what the kingdom now people promise but can't possibly deliver. That's the key to get what the ecumenical people promise but can't possibly deliver. That's the key to get what the faith prosperity people promise but can't possibly deliver. That's the key to get what the charismatic people promise but can't possibly deliver. Joel's army. The church is not Joel's army. Joel's army is what is judging the church. If we repent, God will recall that judgment and pour out His Spirit. That's the key. That's what happened in the early church and that's what's happening today. We've been betrayed. We're small and quivering. Our leaders are afraid and we're not anointed. It's all going to the wall there's one hope we repent or we perish God bless you and thank you